support, including just workshops and capability building activities so that the industry can be, I suppose, uplift and be sustainable as compared to um, broad acre agriculture. So one of the great topics we've got today is responding to COVID-19, how farmers and food enterprises are adapting to their businesses to find new markets. So I'd like to introduce um, Jen Sheridan as the Director of Open Food Networks, Network Australia. The Open Food Network is a not-for-profit building the tools and resources needed to create a new food system that is fair, local and transparent. I'll let Jen share a bit more about what they do, but Jen has worked extensively with communities and enterprises to create thriving food systems. Uh, she's worked with know, know Your Own Food Bowl project at the Food Alliance at Deakin University, and then currently the Food, Pr uh, food Print Melbourne project as part of the Victorian Eco Innovation Lab and Melbourne Sustainables. Sustainable Society Institute at the Uni of Melbourne. They are long titles, but we know that universities love to give everything long titles. So welcome, Jen, and welcome everyone that's uh, that's online. It is a small group today, as I said, I think with school holidays and uh, opening up, up of uh, relaxing of restrictions in regional Victoria, we've got a slightly small group. So we want to make it as interactive as possible. So I'll hand over to you, Jen. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and just to let everyone know, is everyone okay if we're recording it today? Um, just so there's a few people who weren't able um, to make it, but were really keen. So I suppose just keeping that in mind as um, it will be interactive um, and we want to be a sort of safe room to feel like you're, you're sort of sitting in the room with others, um, but that it will be going out to a few other participants as well afterwards. Okay, I will share my screen and and the other thing, Jen, if anyone wants to put any questions into the chat function specifically, I'm happy to then just read those out as need be. Happy with that? Sounds great. Um, so just in terms of, I'm sure everyone's very familiar with Zoom etiquette now, but if you could just keep yourself on mute um, when you're not talking and feel free to use the chat um, to you know, make any comments as, as we're going along and as Sharon says, we can pick those up um, and, and be able to kind of respond to those as we go. Given that we are a small group, rather than sort of sharing just straight into the chat, do people want to chime in with just a little on where you are and what your kind of connection to this topic is in terms of um, the farm or food business organisation, um, in terms of what what, what piques your interest about today's topic? Yeah, and I might dob in Carmel Masterson first, that way she can lead uh, who she is. How's that, Jen? That, that'll relax the room. <laughs> Great. Unless Carmel's gone to uh, pull some no, guys. Can... My, internet just, my internet just totally blanked out. I only came on, as you said, my name. What am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> Just, we're going to do a quick intro, Carmel. Since we're a small group, it'd be just great that Hi. everyone knows everyone in the room. Hi, I'm Carmel uh, from Springmount Fine Foods. We are uh, producers of black garlic, is our main product. Um, but we also do garlic sauces and vinaigrettes and um, fruit pastes and things like that. So we farm our own garlic and... Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much us. So we sell to wineries and specialty producers, cafes, restaurants, um, and a little bit online. Fantastic. Uh, Jean-Paul, do you want to go next? Uh, so, sorry, I'm Jean-Paul. I am a winemaker. Um, I make yeah, a big range of wines. I'm only a small producer, but I experiment with a lot of different things, um, like some preservative-free wines. Um, I also make some vermouths. You probably know it better under brands like Martini. Um, yeah, and I just um, just literally come from the vineyard because Bob Bruce is happening. It was very exciting. Excellent. Georgia, did you want to chime in? Hi, everyone. I'm Georgia. I work for the Open Food Network as well, but I live um, locally in Gordon. Um, and um, was just really interested in this topic to meet a few more local producers in Hepburn um, Shire. I have a background in um, growing garlic and um, am hoping to become a local producer in the future sometime. 
Um, so it's lovely to meet you all. Uh, should we throw to next? Uh, I can't see a name on one person. Was it Anita from memory? Um, yeah. yeah, my name's, yeah, hi. Um, my name's Anita. My video's not working at the moment because I'm just in a car doing a child pickup, so sorry about that. Um, I'm in um, southwest Victoria, so down in Portland, um, and I oversee a group, so a collective of um, local food producers, and we're just redeveloping ourselves and just going through a whole new um, branding and, and marketing um, exercise. Um, and so we've probably got about 20, 25 members that are a whole variety of whether it be artisan sourdough or strawberry growers or raspberry growers. So, um, so I'm sort of just overseeing a collective of people and assisting them um, navigate to try and get their products online and all of that stuff. Um, Although the only thing we don't have, we have a lack of garlic down in the southwest. So if anyone wants to send me some garlic, we would be happy to sell garlic down here. Excellent. Um, Chris. Do you want to... Yeah, hi, Chris Yannis, Women of Development Association. So based up in Horsham. Um, involved as we're at the start of a journey trying to, I suppose, cultivate and encourage some, some of the, I suppose, hobby Producers is probably the best way to describe them. They haven't even really thought through the business and taken through this innovation process. We're about to get a program under the line. I'm sort of and trying to grow my knowledge so I can best encourage and support and cultivate these innovators and also the people around the innovators is probably just as important the network of uh, people that will require for the uh, people who've got these ideas to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and last. Gladys, I think you've just joined us, but just a quick intro if you could. Uh, you might be on mute, I don't think you are, but... Mm, she's not on mute, but... Okay, that's, that's okay. We'll, um, we'll we can wait. come back to Gladys. Yes, we'll wait to that later. <laughs> So in terms of what we're going to go through today, um, basically we're talking a little bit about the impacts of COVID-19 on sort of short supply networks, farmers and community food enterprises. And for us, community food enterprises is defined as really any enterprise that has kind of social and health and ecological goals at its core. So that can be anything from a farmer um, through to a very large organisation. Um, and it's not really around the structure of it is more around the, eco the goals, I suppose, of just not looking at it purely from a profit perspective. So that's a little bit of background on that phrasing. What we're talking about is coming from a survey that we've been undertaking since COVID hit. Um, so we've had it open, and I'll include the link a little bit later on, um, but just kind of trying to understand what's happening on the ground uh, as it was unfolding and trying to build a resource of sort of building the picture of what's happening in this sector so that people can communicate it to government and to policymakers and to funders and to their own communities and also to learn from each other. And so the way that we've done it is it's a survey that's been open to all and it's also that the answers are also open to all. Um, so there's a couple of hidden columns with contact details and that sort of thing, but I'll include the link to it at the end of the presentation so you can kind of trawl through and see much more detail as well. About, there's something like about 85 responses there of what people have been doing during COVID. And so what has been happening? I'll go through what's been happening pretty quickly because I think that probably it's reasonably familiar to a lot of people. And then we'll talk a bit more in a bit more detail around how people have responded to some of those things. But essentially what people have said is that demand increased dramatically. Um, so for some people it was, you know, really significant, like just 10, you know, 10 times as much as they were normally doing. Um, and but for most people, it was around 20% increased demand. And that had spikes pretty similar to what you see here. So this was the turnover through passing through the Open Food Network platform. Um, so we run an open source software platform that helps farmers sell directly. And so this is probably just a pretty good indication of 
the sector as a whole in terms of some of those spikes and drops as lockdowns happened and lifted and happened again. And for most people, they've said that they've plateaued at about 20 to 30% above where they started this year. What they've found is that for many people, they were struggling to meet new customers' needs whilst also meeting their existing customers' needs. And for a lot of people, relationships were really important with their customers. Um, and so that was quite a struggle for them uh, to figure out how to keep those existing customers happy because I suppose they had a faith that those people would come back. Uh, they found people were really wanting a complete shop in one place. They, you know, they wanted their eggs, their bread, everything um, together where possible. Uh, they wanted delivered. And there was a challenge sometimes to meet quite culturally diverse needs. Um, so what a complete shop looks like for one person isn't what a complete shop looks like for other people. Um, and there were sort of differences, I think, in supply chains for probably also different products in terms of, say, different vegetables that were really popular with certain communities or different, um, you know, spices or that sort of thing. Um, so that, that was sort of quite different from community to community. Uh, and then there was the point also about the loss of other income streams. So, for example, people weren't able to do, you know, pay for pick your own or coming onto the farm for workshops, um, some of those types of other kind of value add that's not solely the just sale of produce. Um, but this quote down the bottom is probably reasonably typical from what a lot of people are saying is that they lost a lot of their, you know, they lost all of their sales through for hospitality sales, but they've tripled their sales that are going at direct retail prices to eaters. And so that's been a reasonably successful kind of pivot for a lot of people. Um, the other key thing that has come through is around people's workforce. Is can I just add, can I just add there, Jen, um, you went back to that one around 30%. One of our uh, project advisory group members Basically, his sales were down 70 to 80%. Uh, he is a young farmer, and one of the things he decided to do was flex into working on projects and around that farm during during the time and said, well, you know, I can't gear up with farmers markets. My produce was, he does Portuguese tarts and a whole other range of sort of produce that wasn't as easy to flex immediately online. So he then looked at what other projects he could do within his business that he, he planned to do, but were sort of in the future. So we've heard a lot of those stories where people have decided to work on specific things other than gearing up their sales, if they can afford to do it. Yeah, that's true. And certainly other people have talked about, um, you know, selling off a reasonable proportion of their flock, for example, and kind of resting pastures more um, for a greater period of time and that sort of thing. So kind of using it as an opportunity in terms of farm um, pasture growth as well. Um, in terms of workforce, people were talking a lot about their fears of, you know, a lot of people had quite small businesses and they were really worried about what would happen if someone got COVID. Um, they found their staff had reduced availability due to being high risk or homeschooling children and so on, or particularly a lot of organisations that had some kind of volunteering links. They had reduced volunteer numbers due to being in that sort of high risk category again with like older volunteers, that sort of thing. They struggled to onboard people quickly to deal with that, you know, growth in demand. And I think this will come through in a minute, but there was that sort of challenge around like, well, how long is this going to last for? Do you pivot your business or do you just ride it out or do you just not meet that demand? Um, what do you do? Some, quite a few peri-urban um, region farms, so kind of, you know, reasonably close to Melbourne, had links to urban workforces. And so they've had to sort of move their entire workforce to the farm for lockdown and create sort of a 12 person bubble on farm, for example, um, rather than risk their workforce not being able to make it out of the, the ring of steel or, or worse would be bringing out the infection in an infection. Um, and then a lot of people have had, you know, sort of the publicised challenges around harvest workers, but similarly other people have, you know, things like wolfers and so on, um, that they're struggling to, you know, they're sort of, that would be part of their normal labour makeup and they don't have that at the moment. And then the other big thing is a lot of people are talking about burnout, you know, they're being asked to be a lot of things to a lot of people and on call <laughs> for a lot of the time. Um, and I think that that has been a real challenge as well. 
And I'll just go through a couple more and then we can chat about which of these kind of resonates and which haven't been identified in terms of that are unique in this in the Hepburn region as well. Um, but obviously one of the really big ones we're going to talk about today is sales channels. And so one of the things that happened that um, was say, for example, a lot of the farmers markets closed. And I suppose people suddenly realized the precarious nature of some of their sales channels or the lack of control that they had over certain channels. Um, and so we'll talk about this a little bit later on as well in terms of how some people have responded. Uh, there was obviously a loss of hospitality channels. A lot of people had a drop in in-person farm gate sales and then there were a lot of challenges of sourcing inputs. So um, seedlings, tools and even tractors. There was a tractor shortage um, across Australia earlier this year. One of the other things was that people talked about lots of in new entrants into the market. And so this was one that I snapped off Instagram where it's like, can you even imagine you're competing with BP for fresh fruit and veg delivery alongside, you know, I think Jim's mowing have pivoted to having like Jim's fresh fruit and veg. But also a lot of other people were saying that they were kind of having sales cannibalised by some of the people who had previously been supporters in, in some ways so you know if you imagine your local cafe has decided to start doing a veg box option but it's all coming from the wholesale markets and people are having to choose between keeping their local cafe surviving or keeping you surviving um, and that felt like a very challenging thing and i think particularly some regions it felt like they were they really sort of felt like they were being undermined by um, reasonably sort of inauthentic close connection to farmer options. Um, and as a result, we're kind of struggling to cut through with their normal marketing messages around the sort of value of the service that they delivered and the kind of connection to farm and the ecological benefits and all of those sorts of things, um, because people are just replicating that messaging, but using it for essentially a wholesale sourced, um, you know, Epping market sourced fruit and veg box. Uh, and then there was, though, a little bit of um, one that surprised me was that some people had said that a reduction in imports of some products had actually opened up markets to local sellers. So because supply lines got a bit jammed up on certain types of products, um, they felt more able to actually sell their produce locally. Um, and so that was a surprise to me. The main thing people have talked about in terms of business planning is like how long will it last? Should you invest in a new solution or not? What's happening when it will, you know, is it going to keep happening? Will it apply now? Will it apply later? How do I plan for this? Um, I think people have been really struggling with even crop planning, you know, those discussions around should we be planting foods that need to be cooked? Like should I not plant my lettuce mix? I'll plant spinach instead, which has to be cooked so that I know that I'm not at risk of contaminating people or, you know, there was just a lot of confusion around. So I'd really be interested to hear from, from the rest of you and say, what's, what other challenges have you experienced in your region and which of those challenges identified kind of really resonate? I suppose I'll, I'll just jump in around the, um, the conversation on the online platform. As you know, um, the Victorian country markets, which was the Victorian farmers markets online that was launched by the government. Um, there's been a number that, that we're aware of in Hepburn that have tried to capture that market because everyone shifted to online. And as you said, they've, they've just started businesses from scratch. There's, there's one floating around that's selling everything from, you know, pencils to batteries to, to putting food as well. So that seems a complicated business brief in itself, but people are trying to create themselves jobs and, and that's fair enough. So um, we're finding, and, and, and I know Carmel's online and Danny is as well, who's part of our project advisory group, it's a very noisy space for us to work on what and and this would be interesting for Chris's point of view if you're talking about the development of a collective or or and even Anita how you do that in that noisy space you can't just go and grab something off the shelf and think that's going to be the right model it takes a long time to understand what it looks like and I, I think that's um 
that's a learning piece that I've seen being head, you know, heading up this project right at the start. There was no COVID and then four weeks later, I was right in the middle of the startup of my project and, and that's what I saw flooding of this information. Um, so I'm keen to see how other people have, have tried to manage through that noise. It's, it's Chris here, I can't, I just, as I say, my wife works for a lentil business in, in the Wimmera and um, she's in the past used the Australia Post platform because it's not their core business, uh, but they, they have some domestic packaging and they have just sort of do it and and it was basically they get occasional orders through that and not um yeah not spend any time marketing at all domestically the click for vic campaign they've noticed every time there's been an advertising campaign around that because they signed up for that because once again it was no cost to sign up and it was a different uh logistics business model but she found it once again for a business that wasn't their core business it was very good because Basically, the the all the logistics was taken on by Click for Vic. Basically, and all you had to do is once every week, basically hand a big box of whatever that was you were told, and that was all you had to do with the supply chain. Uh, the having bought stuff through it, it works relatively well. Um, occasionally, I don't think they've got their two-way communication quite right and they're running late or not sometimes they don't quite nail it but um, I'm sure they're not doing a cost evaluation of it either because their supply trucks and everything like that are definitely not necessarily fit for purpose so I'd imagine yeah as soon as the government takes away the purse it'll collapse which is very disappointing not thinking about uh, how to make sure there's a legacy out of it which is my concern whenever someone's invests in a digital product it will just end up as digital dust and anyone that puts great effort into it, it'll fall over because they haven't really thought about the whole supply chain and making it sustainable, which is, I think, probably the disappointing bit, but um, I think that's part of how the Click for Vic campaign came around. It was a couple of people uh, having a red hot go and not hustling, but um, having a red hot go and worrying about the costs and business model afterwards, which is the startup culture. Uh, but yeah, I have a feeling it won't be there in 2021 just because it just, the trucks they're using and everything like that just, yeah, there's no way it's just sustainable. Yeah, yeah I agree. With and certainly, yeah. We, Carmel, were you going to say something? I was just going to say I agree with that. Like it was, um, it was thrown together so quickly as a, um, a very quick response to the COVID. Um, they have definitely got better. Like it, it is running a lot smoother, but I agree with you, Chris, that it um, it's probably not going to be sustainable. Just the um, just the model itself, as far as people can order one product, one very small product, and get I know free delivery is not going to always go, but I think long term it's um, it's probably a little bit doomed. But it's look, it has helped us a little bit. Um, it was a mess at the beginning, but they've sort of got their stuff together okay now. Mm. Maybe that's a good one to move on to some of the successful responses as well then, um, because certainly that has been pretty key um, in terms of how people have responded uh, are some of those online options. Um, so just before we dive in, I think one of the things that came through really strongly in the survey is that people were talking about that they did sort of see this as a potential opportunity. Um, sorry, some of those quotes there. So you know that it's it's I think hard to grasp because it feels so overwhelming. Um, and certainly, I, I know that we sort of you know we're in that same boat in terms of as Open Food Network as an organisation, we're a small team and so on as well. Um, but it's interesting just to see how people are kind of quite excited and energised by the connection that they're getting with their customers and with new customers as well. So in terms of some of the really successful stories that we've seen coming out of this, um, one of the things that we've seen work really well is people expanding their range to offer a complete shopping experience. 
And I think that this is probably really relevant for hip burn because it's, um, it's something that we're seeing working really well in regional areas where they're backloading people, you know, where it might be an individual farmer. So in this case, Chloe from Somerset Heritage, she's a veg farmer in Seymour. Um, and she's now doing deliveries of her products and uh, a fellow farmer's eggs into Melbourne on a Thursday. She then picks up um, a whole host of other products. So I think it's mostly kind of bread um, and a few other kind of not too perishable products that get backloaded back up to the Seymour region. And so then she has a reasonably complete kind of shopping experience um, for people in her region. So that's a, she's doing it that as then locals can pick up on Friday or Saturday morning from they've got a sort of drive through farm stall um, contactless pickup. Uh, and so that's been a shift that she's made during COVID. And I think that's been really successful. And we've seen a few other people do similar things. Um, we've seen people head online. Um, so obviously Open Food Network, where, where I work, is, is one of the options that people have used. Um, and I think maybe there's, there's some advantages and disadvantages to each of the main ways that people are doing things. So the advantage with Open Food Network is that um, it's a network solution. So farmers, when we're seeing people using it best is when they're not just selling their own products directly, but when they're also collaborating with others. Um, so one of the great things is that with an open food network shop, you get your own shop front, but then you can also just quite, you know, with like the click of a button, give permission to another shop to stock your products. So, you know, in that example with Chloe, she's just got, um, you know, Dalhousie farm eggs, they just get to click a button and their eggs show up in her shop front as well. Um, and so that's how farmers markets are kind of heading online. And also we're seeing people start up little food hubs and, um, you know, sort of small groupings of producers and producer collectives. Um, some of the more, you know, sort of well-known ones might be something like Prom Coast Collective. Um, and that's that way people are just managing it all in one place. So that's one of the can, I ask, can I ask Jen how that works then? Do you have to get um, authorization from the other or collaborate with the other store holder to say, look, you know, um, are you happy that I promote your eggs? I mean, they, do they get any kind of commission for that or is that just a kind of that's a collective value add where... Um, it's yeah, everyone, just, everyone decides it differently. So, you know, for example, someone might decide that they want to, you know, that it's in their best interest. So say, for example, it's in Chloe's best interest to be able to offer eggs and bread because more people will come and do a shop with her if they're able to pick up sort of a full groceries basics kind of box. Um, but then other uh, hubs um, or small, you know, producer collectives will, yeah, have a, an administration fee that's the same across, you know, each each person who's, selling into it, um, there'll be an admin fee that covers all the packing and marketing and um, the, you know, shipping into Melbourne or locally or all of that sort of stuff as well. So um, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how people, you know, I think it's the good thing about Open Food Network is that it's got an awful lot of flexibility. The bad thing is that that makes it complex for people to use sometimes, but it basically has been designed so that, you know, it's best to design a food enterprise that works for you and then figure out how to use the platform rather than kind of, you know, retrofit the other way. And that could work quite well in, say, Carmel Masterson's case if, you know, black garlic, vinaigrettes, and then Carmel could work with a grower who particularly didn't want their own online shop but wanted, you know, because they're basically on farm, they're not interested in the sort of sales end uh, at, the, at the end of the value chain she could actually take that produce and then sell it through her shop and make more of a collective platform. They'd still have their own shop, but they'd rather than them de then delivering it, they'd deliver it to her and then distribute it that way. Okay. Okay. So the logistics would be that it would all come together in the one, like they'd deliver to me and then I'd do all the distribution. Is that what you're saying? That's certainly well, that, I think lots of yeah. people do it that way or some people do kind of... Um, the almost like logistics on the road as in they'll do the, you know the pickup as they're going and then do a drop off right. so they'll kind of run it as a loop um yep. but yeah it is often easiest for all the kind of producers to come to one spot so i think you know the prom coast example would be 
they sell from 20 farmers. Um, and so that would be all of the pre-sales happen and then all the farmers bring their produce in on a, you know, I think it's like a sort of somewhere between a Saturday afternoon and a Sunday morning. They've got a now, I think, a paid team doing the aggregating and packing boxes and everything. And then there's local pickup Sunday afternoon and then they drive the trucks into Melbourne on Monday um, with all of that produce and do deliveries in Melbourne at sort of different hubs or that they've now changed to doing weekly deliveries across probably about sort of 20 suburbs and doing it direct to door um, during COVID. Good. Um, yeah. so the other options, I guess, are things like Victorian country market. So uh, that has the, you know, wonderful advantage of, like you're saying, there's the logistics are taken care of um, and there's, you know, government money backing it and, and doing ad campaigns and so on. I think the disadvantage is that there's no, you know, you've really got no control over your supply chain. It's still kind of sending it out into a void. Um, and so it means that you're losing that, you know, when something goes wrong with the logistics, um, it's sort of still your brand that people associate with the end products that they receive and you have no control over that customer experience. So I think that's one of the challenges that people have talked to us about. Um, and then the other one is, yeah, that sense of like, are they building a sales channel that will persevere beyond this? So I think quite a few people have talked about the value of getting new customers through this period and they're building new relationships and they are kind of retaining that, you know, 20 to 30% bounce um, in, in turnover and customer numbers. And with the Victorian country market, they're not feeling very secure about whether that will endure. And so you know, do they have that direct relationship with the customer or how are they going to maintain a relationship with the customer? And are they going to be able to keep meeting that customer's needs once the free logistics runs out? So that's kind of, I guess, you know, um, I think it's a good option for people who really only want to do this for a short time and need that bump, but are intending to go back to exactly how they were before. Um, whereas I think other people have chosen to do something a bit more direct so that they can, I guess, kind of secure a, a sales channel, not just for now, but also for future. Um, and so for some people who are, you know, it's the second time that, you know, they might not, online sales might not be their main business, um, but they've activated already once during bushfires and then now again during COVID and you sort of like, almost at fire season again, <laughs> like, you know, so it might not be your normal one, but it's nice to be able to sort of switch on and off. Um, Excuse me, Jen. Yeah. Talking about your open food network and then also with the Click for Vic, haven't you really, I suppose, talked about what's happening in 2020, really the history of the agribusiness food chain of basically the thing is, are you a very good producer at something or are you very good at selling something on how do you actually get your goods to the market? And uh, then, then it's actually better to get together as a collective and work together and share the costs. But then you have to have the government as soon as you get to a certain scale. Oh, I do all the hard work and everyone else rips me off because they don't pull their weight. But what you're highlighting happening now, I suppose, in a fairly compressed period is a lot of people getting in, introduced to the challenges of the agribusiness um, supply chain, which is why I suppose Broadacre and some of the commercial chains have come about because of all these thousands of years of history, just all of a sudden always driving people to go to what they're best at. And in the end, some people are really good at growing stuff. Other people are really good at moving stuff around and even more other people are really good at selling stuff and they tend to stick in their own lanes. But 2020 is sort of bring it all to the surface fairly quickly. Yeah, absolutely. There's been some steep uh, uphill curve of learning for quite a few people this year, I think. Um, and I think I think that's where that collective work is is really important as well. You know, where it is the opportunity for it to not all rest on you know a single farm to deliver all of those different services and skills. You know, there's already so many skills that one farm. Yeah, yes, having had a fair bit of exposure to the co-ops and working through that as in previous life, I think that'll be the issue is will people be willing to invest in governance and getting those co-op structures or the collective structures so that they're comfortable to invest in because if they're going to have 
once again, a bit like the online platforms, if they're going to last, the level of governance of how people enter them and how people can exit them, because capital's involved, is going to be the key for them, because goodwill will only get you so far. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, we've got another webinar later in the year, which is sort of around some of that, like farmers and foodies working together, because I think that's one of the successes that's come through during COVID, is when it's not just farmers driving a collective to sell, but a broader community where, you know, you have some people who aren't just straight up exhausted from farming who have the energy to, say, drive the logistics or the marketing as well. Um, so that's been a really interesting thing to see that come through as well during, during COVID. Um, one of the other things, I guess, the other thing that's kind of come through with the online sales channels is, I guess, the other option is people having their own website. Um, and so a lot of people would have either a Square site or a Wix site or a WordPress site. Um, and obviously they have the advantage of you've got complete control of everything in terms of branding and no one else's branding is near it. Um, for Square, it's got the advantage of a lot of people use Square payment methods for markets. So um, that works in well with a Square site. Um, but the disadvantage is you are out on your own a bit. You know, it's, it's that same thing of you're having to carry that full burden of the marketing and so on, um, as Chris was saying as well. So they've all got their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, the other thing is that people are very... Can I, can I just um, jump in for a second? And I'm sure everyone can see it in the chat, but um, Gladys is, you know, first, just challenged a little bit with the audio on Zoom. First time user, good on you, Gladys. Glad you're all over Zoom, you'll love it. We'll all be doing Zoom and we'll be Zoom 101 in another year. Um, basically, Gladys is a, a, grows veggie boxes and lives around Clunes. Um, and she had to stop uh, work to be a, well. She stopped work to be a full-time farmer, and a, one of the biggest challenges has been um, how much produce to actually grow to supply. So those supply chain um, decisions, um, and we've heard that over and over again. As you said, Jen, that 30% increase the sales, and then people said, oh, "This is going to do I keep growing?" Especially if you're planting a crop six months, twelve months in advance, is how much do we plant for trying to work out what's going to happen in the middle of 2021. Um, she's also put in there, we've found the challenge just to have enough produce during the winter period to, to um, you know, be able to supply her customers. So thanks, Gladys, for that. Mm. And I think that's another really interesting one as well, where um, so far there's like quite a few very regionally based collectives, but I think there's great potential for more... Um, distributed collectives in terms of being in different growing zones and, and that sort of thing as well. Um, I, I think there'd be some pretty similar challenges that other other veg farmers have, have identified through this period too, right? Um, the other thing that's kind of come through, and actually the other one that's, people are running out of animals now as well is one, one other thing that we're seeing. So people have been, I guess, just turning off animals as fast as they can to keep up with demand because they don't know when you know something might some restrictions might change again and so it's all the abattoirs might shut or that sort of thing um so i certainly we've been hearing from some farmers who are basically like we haven't taken a break from selling for 10 years but we actually just don't have enough animals at the moment to sell um so that's an interesting one as well that there's probably going to be a bit of a gap for some people um, some of the other ones, some of the other sales channels that people have been doing is procurement into social enterprises, um, which I might put my colleague Georgia, who's in this on the spot, uh, because she's been managing this much more. Um, and so maybe Georgia, would you mind saying just a couple of words about the Moving Feast initiative? Sure thing. Um, so Moving Feast is a uh, collaborative project from a number of social enterprises, primarily based in Melbourne, although I believe there is one up in Horsham who might be involved. Um, and they, are, they came together um, following um, COVID-19 um, to create a pandemic response to ensure that Victorians had access to the food um, that they need, so particularly working with um, vulnerable populations. Um, and so a lot of these social enterprises um, were procuring food already, um, but 
possibly in smaller scale and and more so through wholesale networks. But by coming together, um, they realised, I guess, that um, given their social enterprises and they have such a vested interest in creating long-term um, successful impact through the work they do, they really did want to connect more with Victorian um, producers and make sure that they were supporting um, long-term sustainability and viability of our local food systems and not undermining them by um, just kind of supporting the wholesale market and those networks at the expense of smaller scale producers who um, many of whom were also struggling. And so a lot of them have been really interested in learning about how to do um, more local procurement um, and, and potentially working together to find a procurement solution with Victorian farmers that meets their needs as a collective. And I think they're a particularly interesting case because they really do have um, the impetus to um, and the flexibility to make this work. So unlike a lot of other big businesses, they're not just profit driven. They really want to um, support um, our communities and um, and do it as best they can. And so, um, yeah, I think that they're a really big opportunity right now, but also moving forward um, to link them in with um, more Victorian producers um, and, and potentially change the way they procure in the longer term as well. And that's some interesting, that's where they're almost looking at like wholesale community supported agriculture options as well, where it's like that risk sharing between the purchaser and the farmer at a bigger scale than we've, we've seen. In that's a really, really exciting piece of work, Georgia, that I'll, I'll, I'll dovetail with you a little bit more on that because that's part of the, uh, and Danny I know is online now, the passion around healthy food, food security, local economy, working collaboratively. And, and I think we, out of COVID, we've seen how important food security is with, you know, uh, international shutdowns and not being able to get prod, produce from overseas. Not that that has mattered so much, I suppose, in Victoria because we grow so much, which is, gives us a great competitive edge. But how we can keep that more uh, locally and sustainably from even a, um, a logistics point of view, because Chris was mentioning about the logistics or even Carmel sending one product is not very good for carbon miles if we think, think very early in the piece about climate change. So I think I've just quickly Googled what they do and I think that's, an, that's a really exciting piece of work and I'm sure Chris would be interested in that in the Wimmera and even Anita down in the southwest. Yeah, I think that's, sorry, yeah, we've had a few discussions and it's it's getting the group, as I say, so in that Wimmera community, they grow a lot of pulses, but they're generally growing thousands of tonnes at each year. And so it's getting the the, the group, groups understanding the scales they're wanting to deal with. So, all right, if you want one tonne, do you want a one tonne in a bulker bag or do you need them in five kilo packs or whatever because each price is different because if you're buying it a ton at a time you basically can pay whatever the price is for a ton really and it, but then you've got to have the ability to handle it at the other end so it is this logistics piece which is the bit the group i've been dealing with discussing around this which i think is the same group about they've just got to think through their logistics a bit when they're dealing with the opportunity there is huge opportunity there but if you get a bag with a ton of grain in it how are you going to handle it? Or do you actually need 15 kilo boxes or 15 kilo bags or whatever? It's being able to articulate that clearly and then the connection can really happen quite easily. Um, but it's, yeah, because in the, in the bulk commodity system, which it's all the farmers used to at our end, it's getting the, trend, the language between the two lined up because that's where the challenge is at the moment. Yeah, yes. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say you're spot on there, Chris. And I think... Um, the appetite for that connection is is developing and the knowledge that people, like even just to build that knowledge of, well, how, how much is a tonne of grain and how, do, how could I break that down? Um, I think starting to have these conversations, these social enterprises are thinking really innovatively. There's an example of one in Whittlesea, which I'm not, maybe you are connected in with um, this organisation, but they wanted um, bulk 
dry goods and they had a local disability service who were interested in packing that down for them into smaller one kilo bags um, and they could do that really affordably. And so, um, you know, they were able to leverage partnerships and relationships they had because they're in, you know, um, they're a social enterprise and they're in that social sector. Um, and ultimately it can be really beneficial for lots of stakeholders because they're leveraging those relationships. Mm. Yeah, it's been really interesting to watch that develop. Um, so the other sales channel that has been interesting to note is that people have actually counterintuitively almost have been opening up more on farm infrastructure. And I think that's again, coming down to that control over supply chain where they've felt um, so people, you know, invest really investigating much more seriously on farm abattoirs and all, of, and even on farm markets and so on. Um, and obviously, that's you know the balance between biosecurity or all of those things. But against having seen what felt like a secure public space being kind of taken away from them because you realise that oh, actually this committee controls the use of that park and therefore our market isn't going ahead. So I think there's been a, almost like a sense of putting collaborative infrastructure that's open to multiple farmers in some in most cases, but on someone's farm. I'm just going to go through the others really quickly so that we've got some time. Oh, well, did you want to share the success of the Ballarat? Was it the Ballarat Mushroom Farm? Yeah. Do you want to share a little bit of the success for that at the wider group? Um, that, because that's one of those things you're talking about. Somebody's already doing their own farm gate, but then bringing a whole heap of uh, producers for the journey. Do you want to just quickly share about that, Carmel? Oh, you were directing at me. Um, yeah, the Ballarat Mushroom Farm. Exactly what you're just saying, Jen. They um, they just they started with a small gazebo um, on their property, which is now um, now they're talking about building a cafe and oh, everything in a new shed. Like it's gone. Absolutely, they they are almost single handedly kept us afloat for the first lockdown because they took on just a one by one, very slowly took on new producers. And they, they were having lines of cars lining up down the street trying to get in. They just did it really well. And, um, but yeah, very, very good thinking um, straight away at the beginning of lockdown. But anyway. And I think we've seen some other smaller examples of, um, you know, so McIver Farm Foods in Tuberac, they, you know, I think they had, a, they were, were due to open a butchery shop that, and opened it sort of on the day that they opened, they ended up opening it up for them and two other producers who've had farmers markets cancelled that day, for example. So there's been really interesting examples of um, just putting the same thing in one place for even if it's a day or a month or, you know, working together in that way. Um, I won't go through workforce too much because that's probably not as interesting, but the other thing that's come through is um, people talking about the value of, sharing information um, so we had weekly webinars that open food network were running it for the first two months of COVID, um, just to kind of share practice both internally in australia but also with expertise from other countries that were further along so for example we had, you know beijing farmers markets talking about how they had been responding and what their practices were and a lot of people have come through saying that they formed town-based knowledge sharing networks um, or that they really took advantage of some of those online Facebook groups or other types of online platforms, and Instagram friends and all of those sorts of things for sharing practice. And then I think it's also been really clear that the membership of advocacy groups, you know, the, in terms of, you know, being a Victorian Farmers Market Association member, for example, in terms of the work that they have done to kind of keep farmers markets open and, you know, joining the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance and so on has been, I think, really clear. One of the things, so I wanted to just get to this part because I think this is the kind of where, th where people are starting to turn their attention now is how do you retain some of that, that bump of sales and that bump of interest? Um, and the thing that's coming through really strongly is, is storytelling. You know, so BP Home Deliver doesn't have the story that, um, and connection that local farmers do. And there's such a media interest at the moment. Um, so I'll share a link a bit later on with some resources that we've got on our sort of resources site around like how to pitch to media, how to talk to media um, and those sorts of things, because I think it's, it's such a great opportunity at the moment. Um, and the other thing is in terms of people are talking about really where they previously haven't had a receptive government, um, they do at the moment. And so making sure that you are contacting, you know, 
a local member or your local government to sort of, um, it, you know, it's obviously in Hepburn, you've got a really supportive local government around some of these issues, but how, how are you kind of showing the impact that it's happening um, now while it's in the moment as well? So people are talking about, you know, who, who kept people fed basically. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is around retaining some of that fresh interest. So I guess that's where it's really great to make sure that people are selling in like, essentially make sure that your customers are giving you their email addresses because it's that, it is that direct connection, that ability to keep them coming back and to ask them how to shift what you're doing post COVID. Um, that's really coming through as very important as well. Uh, so people are really seeing the opportunity to educate um, and also to sort of yeah, give, give that, um, yeah, to retain those customers through that direct connection. So I'll send out an email afterwards with any of the links that I've shared, but that resources site has, uh, I think we've got a recent blog on how to retain customers and then there'll be other ones on media and so on. The other thing that I just want to get through is the collaborative logistics. So people have been working with other food enterprises in sort of some of the ways that we've mentioned. Um, the other one, you know, there's, there's all sorts of great examples of people using route planning apps to increase efficiency and aggregating and packing together. But one that came through is really interesting for me is how people are sharing assets. Um, so asking councils or private groups to open up assets for food use. So people are seeing there's a lot of, you know, bowling clubs and town halls and rotary buildings and so on that have basically been turned into food hubs um, across particularly Victoria, given that we're experiencing the longer lockdown. Um, and people are talking about sharing vans and also, you know, we talk about some people not knowing whether to invest in this moment and, you know, do I buy a refrigerated van so I can start doing my own deliveries to Melbourne? But some people have been really good at looking for the underused resources at the moment. So, okay, my local party hire company has a refrigerated van and they're definitely not doing parties at the moment. So can I rent that for a couple of months and, you know, kind of trying to keep some of that kind of local, almost that collaborative economy as well. And we're gonna have a much more detailed webinar specifically on collaborative logistics. Unfortunately, they've had to wait until after the local government caretaker period, but that'll be on Monday the 30th of November um, to really talk through how, you know, a number of, in, in much more detail around how some of the um, organisations and enterprises around Victoria have been doing that. And then just finally, the other thing that's really come through is people are starting new sort of values-based collaborative efforts. So I think, you know, we've talked a little bit around, oh, okay, well, we've seen farmers markets in some regions really thrive through this period. And it's been clear that it was a, a market that was underpinned by a shared understanding around farmer livelihoods and access to produce for, for people in that region. And then in other regions, it's just died and it's become obvious that, you know, an organizing committee really saw it as a tourism thing. And so I think there's sort of been some of those mismatches of values um, or, or opening up, you know, making it more obvious what some of those sort of values underpinning some collaborative efforts are. And so we've seen a couple of startup, um, so Strathbogie Local is one example, um, where it was not farmers, it was, you know, locals who wanted to see something pop up in place of their farmer's market um, once that got shut down. And they're now running a weekly drive-through pickup um, option that services their kind of... Um, you know, the Strathbogie region based out of Violet Town. And so we've got another one that's another webinar that's talking much more about those types of collaborative e efforts. So really nutting down into the Strathbogie local and the Wangaratta Farmers Market Online hub and how they run them and what their structure and logistics and so on is. Um, but we'll go through that in really much more nitty gritty on the 9th of November. And finally, I think it was just the point that um, people are starting to have, you know, you've got a bushfire plan and a lot of people are now starting to have a bushfire recovery plan. But I think this has really presented the opportunity to start to include a resilience plan in terms of businesses. Um, and I think that that's been really unclear 
you know, I, I don't think we really know quite what that looks like just yet in terms of what to include in that. But it is around that sort of sense of ability to think through the core non-negotiable parts and then also how, how things can change and how you're willing to change and what different, the toll of different sort of changes will take on your business and family and, you know, workforce and all those things. So we've just got a couple of minutes left, hopefully. Um, but I'd be really keen to hear what, what of those ideas kind of apply in your region and are there other things that are working well at the moment and are there potential collaborations? I'm probably keen to hear from Anita down in the southwest um, as well, if she's still on. Yep, Anita's still on. I think all. <laughs> Jean Piol had to go and pick up the kids. He says, I got a dash. One thing I just want to share with the group um, is the fact that this particular project, being artisan agriculture sitting within Hepburn and Central Highlands um, region, has been really a pilot for the state government and Ag Victoria to look at um, how small scale producers work better together and find those entrepreneurial opportunities. So, we are a bit of a flag waver to try and help expand out this. And that's why we've, we've brought on Open Food Network because, because of the success that they've not only had um, in the state, but nationally and internationally. And one of the things that even last week in conversation with Ag Victoria is the, the grants programs for small scale agriculture. It's been heavily and overly subscribed all the time. They've done a recent round of uh, another funding and I think it was only, you know, they had $2 million on the table, but there was $15 million of grants that people applied for. So there's either everyone's thinking very deep pockets or there's a real need. So the state government are understanding that small scale are probably one of the biggest sectors that need to keep uh, the economy. Not saying the broad acre, because I think with Chris, the, you're right, the broad acre and small scale need to work better together and understand each other's pain points, I suppose. Um, but I think we've got a great opportunity out of COVID to really keep having the seat at the table of state government saying, well, how do you support the small scale sector uh, at a greater level? Would you agree with that, Jen? Because you're probably across oh. that a lot more with your university work. Um, absolutely. I think in the, you know, so Open Food Network has been around since sort of 2011 um, and we've never seen a moment an opening like this in terms of receptive policy makers that might actually recognise something other than export. Um, so I think that was where, you know, that point around this is the moment to kind of tell your story to both your customers and your communities, but also to, yeah, to policy makers. Um, I think that's where that came through for us really strongly. I think one comment, however, is it's very important to communicate around jobs. So I've found in the Wimmera, where we have a lot of sole traders, basically there's been no, any time you're a sole trader, the state government hasn't been show, interested in showing you a brass razu would be the, uh, and the challenge with the small scale producers, often they're gonna be sole traders. So it is repositioning the discussion. So it's not about individuals as a sole trader because the state government has, even so there's not necessarily employees out there to do the jobs, which is a discussion for another time in living in rural Victoria. Um, and I'm sure the small scale pick, people who want pickers, et cetera, will have that challenge. But at the moment, I think there's a strong ideology, ideology can't even say it, but around, oh, it's gotta be all about jobs. So I think that'll be a key part of the discussion keep up the table, otherwise I'll pay lip service to you and give you nothing. And I think there's definitely something around regional, regional economies and, um, you know, keeping young people in regional economies with opportunities and also what recovery out of this period looks like in terms of, I think those are things that really resonate strongly. So if we take, you know, the Prom Coast example, um, you know, they're, returning 90 cents in the dollar to their producers um, of what's being sold and they're turning over, you know, over $100,000 a month into that Gippsland region. And, you know, it, it wasn't, that money wasn't flowing back into that region before they were doing it. It was, you know, 
staying within that regional economy or um, certainly kind of costing farmers a lot more to make that money because they're all having to drive into Melbourne markets or that sort of thing. Um, and as a result, like where we certainly see across Open Food Network, the number of young farmers on the platform as well. And so talking about the opportunities that exist within small scale farming and mentoring and the kind of scale that permits young people to actually have enough capital to buy in, um, I think those are all really important points as well. Great. Well, I think um, a few of us have all ducked, a couple have ducked off. So um, if we've got no other, Danny, do you want to add anything that about young farmers since you, you are quietly there lurking behind your screen? Here's Danny talking of a young farmer. Hi, Danny. Hey everyone, thanks for the presentation. It's been great so far. Um, yeah, I don't really have a lot to add. I've just been um, doing a bit of cleaning in my commercial kitchen, getting ready for markets again. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's something that I really want to explore online. And um, I really love the idea of collaborative food hubs and, and stuff like that. So it's all really interesting. Um, so yeah, thanks again for putting it on. Sharon, I'd love like for us to get together, like the PAG or just even, um, I don't know, I'll call you tomorrow or whatever, but to, to really work with Open Food Network, if we can have a collaboration within Open Food Network um, and see if we can get a, um, a, a group of us from our local region to be able to have a... Um, well, if you... Use if you that have platform a, now and strike while the iron's hot. Like, we've talked about it, but we haven't done it. It's probably off, off this... But if you have a look in your agenda, Jen is coming to talk to us on Wednesday <laughs> in our project advisory group to talk about no, next I haven't steps. It yet. <laughs> I think this is All right. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chris, Gladys, Danny, Georgia, Carmel and Jen. That's been fantastic. It's... it's, it's uh, you always think it opens up more thought bubbles on, on what we can do, but I think it's a great opportunity. It's really great that I've actually met Chris uh, at Birchett Cropping Group around two years ago now, and Chris has got some great skills out in the Wimmera. So it's great to connect with you, Chris. And if uh, um, certainly I'll share, I'll send you an email, and if you want to tick tack with me about anything particularly, but Jen, Jen's going to share some uh, links and things around what we can dovetail into a bit more, and yeah, keep exploring it because it's a great, great opportunity. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jen. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye.